Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone, and today we're going to look at part 13 of the Fragmented Soul. It's titled Groupings, and at first I was just like having a little trouble connecting to that because I don't have the past experience Pastor Bob has, and, and um, you know, I'm focused on even trying to find a single part and how does that look and how does that feel and how does that communicate? But, but at this level, he's talking about groupings, uh, parts that may have 
suffered abuse by the same source. And instead of, you know, rehashing from each part what happened, when one part can pretty much be the spokesperson and then you can heal several parts at one time. So that makes sense. That makes sense. So this is what we're going, we are going to be discussing today through uh, watching his video teaching on groupings, part 13. And, and as you all know, we participated in the question and answer session in part 12. So if there's questions and things that you want to bring up from that session, we can discuss those as well. So I found the title of this groupings very interesting because like I said in this morning's invite, I said, just like when Yahuwah led his people and the sojourners out of Egypt, the first thing he did was what? He grouped them together according to their tribal formation and shifted them from a slavery mentality, right? He came to set the captives free, did he not? To heal the brokenhearted, did he not? And he grouped them to heal them, to give them identity, belonging. So he shifted them from a slavery mentality to a warrior mentality. So we know his word is true. We are more than conquerors in Yahushua HaMashiach. Now, last week we talked about our focus. And we discussed where our focus is at will guide the direction we go in. It can guide our decisions. It can direct where our lives go through, go what direction our lives go in. Focus. What are we focusing on is very important. We know the 10 spies focused on the giants in the land. They believed in their own strength and not the strength of El. And though they relented and went into battle, they fell, they crashed because they had taken their focus off of the one that led them out of Egypt. They didn't focus on Yah and didn't follow him. And just how do we follow Yahusha? How do we follow in the footsteps of Yahusha? That's what we're supposed to do. Do we do that? How do we do that? Well, is Yahusha not the word? Right. He is the word. And so we follow him by following his word. And so as we discussed in our opening fellowship, many of you bring to the table, dig into his word, search the scriptures, see, see if these things be so, and let his Ruach HaKadosh lead and guide each one of you. So in addition to the angel of Yahweh encamped around us, leading and guiding us by his Ruach HaKadosh, by his word, he's also sent us serving spirits. In Hebrews chapter one, verse 14, it asked the question, are they not all serving spirits? sent out to attend those who are about to inherit deliverance. So the angel of Yahweh encamps around us and he sends us ministering angels as well to minister to our heart. He sends messaging angels to communicate to us. We have guardian angels. We have warrior angels. We don't worship angels, but they are sent to serve us. And we should utilize their skills. That's what they were called to do. In Psalm 34, verse 6 and 7, this poor one cried out and Yahweh heard him and saved him out of all his distresses. 
the messenger of Yahuwah encamps all around those who fear him and rescues them. Exodus 23, verse 20 and 21. See, I am sending a messenger before you to guard you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Be on guard before him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him. For we know rebellion is as witchcraft, right? For he is not going to pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. Psalm 91, 11, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Revelations chapter 7, verse 1 through 4. And after this, I saw four messengers standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another messenger coming up from the rising of the sun, holding the seal of the living Elohim. And he cried with a loud voice to the four messengers to whom it was given to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees until we have sealed the servants of the Elohim, where? Upon their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000, sealed out of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So I want to show a video that Carol Ann shared with me, and it was just like spot on. Because I want us to think about what these serving spirits look like in the microcosm of things, of even our brain, our mind, will, and emotions, and also the macro view of these serving spirits, as did the angelic messenger that rescued Peter. I would call that a macro view of a serving spirit. And previously in some of our other sessions, we, we have looked at the micro view of messaging angels that travel up and down our DNA strands, up and down our DNA ladder, if you will, repairing and healing us. But what might our internal guardian angel look like or be represented by? You know, I never thought of a guardian angel as being something within us in a way. But when I watched this video that Carol Ann came across by Barbara O'Neill, then I had a visual of what guardian that may be. And prayerfully, this will come together for you as well as we watch this video clip. So I'm going to share screen. with man you can rewire your brain show you how you can actually change even the way that you think isn't that good news these pathways are built in our brain we can rewire our brain right up until the day we die we can rewire our brain when you have a look at the head you will see seven avenues of access into the brain. There are two ears, there are two eyes, there are two nostrils, and there is a mouth. Everything we hear or have ever heard, everything we see or have ever seen, everything we smell, and everything that goes into our mouth, whether it be food or drink, has an effect on the brain. Our decisions determine our destiny. So how important that we know something about the decision making part of our brain. This is an area that many people are ignorant. So we're going to begin by looking at the brain. Now the brain from side on 
basically it looks a little bit like this and there is what's called the limbic system and the limbic system basically takes up about that part of the brain and this limbic system is often called the emotional brain and I think we all know about emotions and I think we all know that emotions aren't a very good guide because they go up and down like the wind but there's another part of our brain that God designed to actually control that limbic system that emotional part of the brain so to do this we're going to have a look at the brain from top down from top down you will have a look at the brain like this and in the front part of the brain and we're going to call this the right side of the brain and the left side of the brain and I think the way you're looking it is so in the right part of the brain you could call that the I won't section that's down there now this is a very important part of the brain where it's very important is no I won't have that cigarette no I won't have that cup of coffee no I won't have that big state I'll have a bowl of lentils instead and on the left part of the brain is the I will. And the I will part of the brain is also very important because I will get out of bed and exercise this morning. I will go to bed early. I will make decisions that are helpful for my body. So you've got the I won't and you've got the I will. And we need a little bit of balance in there. And that's where we come to right in the center is the I want part of the brain. What do I want? Do I want a healthy body? And if I want a healthy body, then I can trigger the I won't do that or I will do that. And God designed our brain so that this part of the brain just here in the center is where our goals are. It's called the prefrontal cortex, or sometimes it's called the frontal lobe. And this is where our will is. This is where we make our decisions. And it made a, and the I will, or the I want, threaded through the, won't, through the, through the I want. That's actually what should govern our decisions. And that's so important because our decisions determine our destiny. So in the front part of the brain, this is where our intellect is. This is where our reasoning powers reside. And this is where judgment takes place. It is in this part of the brain where God communicates with man. In Isaiah 1.18, the Bible says, come, let us reason together. You see, this, this is where the reasoning happens. What should I do? Should I stay in bed and have another hour? Or should I get out of bed right now? And that influences whether we do the I will or the I want. That's the way God planned it. Unfortunately, there are many things today that people are doing that are actually clouding or compromising the part where our goals are, the part where our intellect, reason and judgment is. And we've been looking at that this week, though I haven't actually defined it as such. So dehydration compromises it. Late nights compromise it. Lack of exercise compromises it. Bad food compromises it. Bad air compromises it. So on the other hand, when we're well hydrated, when we're well slept, when we've got nourishing food in our bodies, when we're breathing in fresh air, we're having sunshine every day, then the I want part, in fact, one author called it the guardian. That's the guardian that's actually influences the wills and the wants part of the brain, which are, of course, affected by the limbic system, which is your your emotional, your feeling part of the brain. I'd like to use as my framework the seven mental laws that govern the brain and show you how you can rewire your brain, show you how you can actually change even the way that you think. Isn't that good news? The first law is the law of cause and effect. Effect follows cause with unvarying degree all through nature and never should the effect be blamed as the cause. I had a lady come to me and she said, I found the cause of all my problems. I've got chronic fatigue syndrome. 
I said, no, 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 that's not the cause of all your problems. That's actually the effect. <laughs> Even when someone says, I've got depression, do you know you can't just get depression? <laughs> depression is actually an effect. It is not a cause. Dehydration affects depression. <laughs> Late nights depression affect depression. It's Newton's third law of motion. To every action, there is an equal and an opposite reaction. Proverbs 26 verse 2 states that the curse causeless shall not come. You know what that means? No problem happens without a cause. There is always a reason. In fact, to say someone just has something is to defy basic science. So we should always be looking at the cause of a problem. And sometimes the problem for depression could be too much coffee dehydration so that's the best place to start when someone comes to me wanting help with depression do you know that's what I do I said start drinking more water start easing off your coffee you could stop your coffee straight away but you might suffer a clear indication that it's not doing you any good I say start going to bed early start limiting your technology time start seriously assessing what you're watching and the effect it's having on your brain Start exercising. But I don't feel like exercising. Yes, that's your limbic emotional brain. But what do you want? <laughs> I want to feel good. I want to conquer my depression, so I will go and exercise. Can you see how that all threads in to each other? The second law is the law of choice. And the law of choice, as you can see, is determined in that I want, the frontal lobe part of the brain, your guardian, where your goals are. This is what you feel like doing, but this is what you want, so that influences your decisions. And when you're well slept, well hydrated, well sunned, well exercised, well fed, that I want part of the brain is a lot stronger. But we've got something else coming here, and that's habit. You've heard of habit? <laughs> Habit can be our best friends or our worst enemies. To understand habit, I'm gonna draw your brain cell. Here's your brain cell, it's your nerve cell. And we have one trillion of these in our brain. They're the dendrites or the receiving stations. And this is the arm that comes out of the nerve cell. These are the little filaments on the end. They're the boutons. Here is the next nerve cell. Our nervous system is an electrical system and it does not touch, they do not touch each other, they communicate with each other via little chemical messengers in the brain. And these little chemical messengers jump from cell to cell. So the chemical messengers come in, they're encapsulated in the nucleus and then they're sent down the arm and they come into the boutons and then they're released out to the next nerve cells. Now those messages can be traveling anywhere between two and 200 miles an hour. Well, in a crisis, anyone that's been in a war zone, they know you're, you're, you're moving and you're moving very fast. Now, even though you're just sitting here, your brain cells can be moving fast because you're considering everything that you're hearing right now. And when you are hearing the things you're hearing, you're, you're your brain is processing it through your I want. In fact, you're probably hearing some things and you're probably thinking to yourself, I won't have that coffee anymore. Or maybe you're hearing some things and you might start to say, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go to bed earlier tonight so that I can, I will get up and I will. Can you see it all threads through that? It's an amazing brain. In fact, science still doesn't totally understand the full functioning of the brain. If someone says, do you have a computer? You have. <laughs> You've got the most amazing computer on the planet, which is the brain. And did you know that everything you're hearing today, you will be processing. You'll be processing through your what you want, through your goals. You'll be processing it through your intellect, reason and judgment. And you'll be putting in certain spots. And when you go to sleep tonight, when you go to sleep tonight between the hours of 9 p.m. and 2 a.m., then your brain starts processing and filing the things that you heard today. It's an amazing process. How does it know where to put it? It knows where to put it because where your, your want put it. So if you hear that coffee's no good, in fact, it interferes with those neurotransmitters in the, in the brain causing a chemical imbalance in the brain. If you hear that and you think, 
Well, I don't care. I want my coffee. I will have it. When you go to bed tonight, it's going to put it in the spot. I will continue to have it. You see that? God gave us a wonderful thing when he gave us choice. You see, God is not in every man. You would never say God was in Hitler, Mugabe, Stalin. No, no, no. God gave mankind choice. And what a gamble is that? You see, God is a gentleman. He will never force entry. In Revelations 3 verse 20, there's a lovely illustration. It shows God standing at the door and knocking. He says, and if, he said, behold, I stand at your door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and opens the door, he said, I'll come in. How do we open the door? It's right here. What do you want? I will open that door. He will come in. I won't open that door. I want to do my own thing. It says, okay. He's a gentleman. But it does explain the heartache that we see on planet Earth. Some people say, how could God allow that to happen? Unfortunately, God gave mankind choice. He didn't want robots. Do you want people to love you because they choose to love you or they've got to love that person? It doesn't happen, does it? In fact, there's a name for forced love and that is rape. In fact, there's no love there at all. No, God is a gentleman. He woos us, he knocks. <laughs> no, he knocks. And God wants us to hear and open the door according to reason, intellect and judgment. That makes sense. When you get to know a person, what do you do? You spend time with them. You tell them your life. You listen. How do you listen to God? You know when he speaks to us? Very early in the morning. So how do you hear that voice? You have to go to bed? early the night before <laughs> and there's a verse that's in Isaiah 50 verse 4 it says the Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned that I may know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary he wakeneth morning by morning he wakeneth my ear to hear as the learned I love those early early hours of the morning we've got to do our part God gave us choice and one choice that can free human beings from much heartache is the choice to forgive. Let me tell you the story of a man who came to us. His name was Doug. I said, did you have a healthy, happy childhood? He said, no, I didn't. My father yelled at me all my life. He was 40. He had prostate cancer. I said to him, oh, sometimes that's all you can say. Oh, I kept moving on because I could see it really irritated him. I talked to him later after the lecture. I said, Doug, you've heard about the power of forgiveness. Have you forgiven? You don't understand. He yelled at me all my life. I said, I can understand. That must have been very, very hard, Doug. But you've got quite a serious illness now. And, and I believe that for you to heal, you need to forgive your father. You don't understand. He And he was... His voice was rising. I changed the subject. Two minutes later, Doug said to me, I've done it. Oh. <laughs> Congratulations, Doug. Hmm. Now his limbic system, his emotional brain said, don't do this. Can you see that? And all his life, he'd been harboring this. My father yelled at me. My father yelled at me. He yelled at me. He yelled at me. He yelled at me. Can you see what's happening in his brain? What was happening in his brain was he was developing a very strong habit pathway of anger towards his father. You see, it's not a limbic emotional brain decision or you'll never do it. It's an I want decision. What do I want? I want to be free. Notice what he said, I've done it. No emotion there at all. How could there be? How could there be? Don't wait for your emotions. They'll hold you back. You see, the third law of the brain states that your words affect your feelings. So don't wait till you feel like it or you possibly will never do it. That's why it's so important to know about your limbic system to know about your emotional feeling system and understand that your guardian, your own want, that's where you make your decisions. 
Doug wanted to be free. He said, I've done it. I said, congratulations, Doug. You've probably made one of the most important decisions of your life. When he said, I will forgive. What's still the strongest pathway? My father yelled at me all my life. Now, the next time he's tempted with what his father did, he has a choice. Which pathway will he go down? Because he didn't want to be burdened with this anymore. He used his intellect, judgment and his will, his reason. And he said, I won't relate that story anymore because I want to be free from this. I will go down my new pathway. And every time he was challenged, he said, I have forgiven. I have forgiven. Till eventually, he had a new pathway. And because he didn't go down that old pathway anymore, it got thinner and thinner. The research shows it takes 21 days to form a new habit. 21 days of going down the new pathway, it's a physical pathway in the brain. 21 days of not going down the old one, it gets fainter and fainter. When we cherish or entertain negativity, thorns grow. Thorns grow between the dendrites. You see, when a negative thought comes in, let's do it with Doug. When a ne negative thought comes in, my father yelled at me all my life. It's not fair. It comes like a breeze through the branches of your trees. And at that point, you can hold it, we can let it go. Now, all his life, Doug had been holding on to it. He yelled at me, it's unfair, he yelled at me. And thorns were growing. And he had prostate cancer. These are your psychosomatic diseases. When he heard this, and with my little bit of a shove, he made a decision. I won't go there anymore. I will forgive. His goals, his reason, intellect, judgment said to him, it's time to stop. Yeah. <laughs> Does it ever say to you, it's time to stop. And that night after he'd made the decision, a little bit of battle, a few couple of times that day, but he stood firm. When he went to sleep that night, little cells were activated. They're called glial cells. And your glial cells are your body's vacuum cleaners. And there are more glial cells in your brain than nerve cells. And because Doug made the decision to forgive, when he went to sleep between the hours of nine and two, the little glial cells came along and they vacuum cleaned up all the thorns. Science is now showing that forgiveness has a physiological effect on our brain to clean it up. When you're lying in bed about to go to sleep, just think, wow, when I'm asleep tonight, my body's vacuum cleaners are going to clean up all the thorns. My brain's going to process properly, file, system, everything that I did in the day. Amazing things happen when you sleep. Forgiveness is a choice. Just do it. Just do it. You'll get better at it. Practice makes perfect. Practice makes permanent. Repetition is the mother of in retention and repetition deepens the impression. These pathways are built in our brain. We can rewire our brain right up until the day we die. We can rewire our brain. And if you say it's good, guess what? It will be. And if you say it's terrible, guess what? It will be. That's the choice factor. Forgiveness is a choice and love is a choice. Love is not dependent on feelings because our limbic system, our emotional brain, it goes up and down like the wind. Your words affect your feelings, so be very careful on your words. Your words reveal your feelings and you can't let them all out. Some say it's your right to speak your mind. It's your obligation not to speak your mind. 
You don't know the effect of your words on your hearer. And the proverb that says, he that speak, there is he that speaketh like the piercings of a sword. Do you know who it's the piercings of a sword to the most? The speaker. The speaker. The speaker's getting hurt just as much as the one who's receiving them. And when people speak to you like that, just let it, you know what you say? Poor thing, he's got a problem. <laughs> he's got a problem, you don't take it on. Your words reveal your feelings. What happens if you're upset? What if you're upset and angry? Go for a run. Can't run, uh, have a cold shower. It's Melbourne, will it have an even better effect? Have a great big glass of water. Have some chamomile tea. Calm down. Calm that limbic system, that emotional brain down until your guardian's strong. <laughs> your words reveal your feelings, so you gotta deal with them back there, back there in the I want section. The fifth law is the law of adaptation. We've got a changeable brain. And because we've got a changeable brain, we can rewire our brain. There's two proverbs that talk about it. Interesting to note that medicine only acknowledged it in the last 13 years. One proverb is Proverbs um, 13 verse 20, where it says, uh, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed because of the law of adaptation. It's also called neuroplasticity, soft wired. The other proverb is Proverbs 22, 24, where it says, Make no friendship with an angry man. With a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways. Because of the law of adaptation. Because of the law of adaptation, our brain can grow and our brain can shrink. It is true that there are things that damage brain cells, and if they're damaged, they don't grow again. But there are three things today that medicine is showing can stimulate new brain cell growth in the hippocampus part of the brain. Three shockers cause a release of brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Brain-derived neurotrophic factor is a protein that stimulates neurogenesis. Neurogenesis means new brain cells. What are the, what are the three shockers? They're shockers, prepare yourself. You're gonna really have to get to the I will to do them because they're shockers. Fasting. <laughs> an easy way to do it is to have breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, then have an 18 hour fast through to the next morning or come to Misty Mountain Health Retreat where we make it really easy for you and you do two days on vegetable and fruit juices. That's a shocker. It's a shock to the body when the food stops coming. That's one shock. The next shock is finishing every hot shower with a quick cold. Notice I didn't say long cold, I'm kind. That's a shocker. You'll go, <gasps> it's a shocker. But it's gonna stimulate your brain to release the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, new brain cells. Number three, high intensity interval training, running for your life for 30 seconds uphills, then having a break and then doing it again. That's a shocker. You're like you're dying. Something else can grow. Every time we learn something new, we develop another dendrite. I love memorizing. It's one of my favorite things to do. And every time I learn new verses, another dendrite. If you play the piano and learn new pieces, there are three things that science shows are the most powerful in developing new dendrites. One is learning a new language, um, learning a musical instrument, and memorizing Bible verses because the, the word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even than to dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's the word of God. That's the Bible. How long does it take to really solidify in your brain? Probably about 21 days. I learn a verse a week. If I do any more, it gets all jumbled up and I can't remember anything. So every time you learn something new, another dendrite grows. That one brain cell can develop 70,000 dendrites. I can hardly get my mind around that one. And you know what the research shows? We can be growing new dendrites right up until the day we die. So there are three things we can grow. We can grow new pathways, we can grow new dendrites, and we can even grow new brain cells. What about shrink? When you forgive, 
When you forgive anyone who's ever hurt you in your life, your glial cells are activated to mop up all the thorns and the pathway to that memory actually shrinks. So it needn't be part of your daily thoughts. That's the good news. So what's the bad news about shrinking? If you don't use your brain cells, you will lose them. Number seven, the last law is the law of diversion. And the law of diversion states that when something is so firmly denied as to refuse any hope for it, the brain has the ability to divert to other pursuits. I love that law because sometimes God closes a door, but what's the saying? When God closes a door, he opens a window. An Italian man said to me, no, 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 no. What we say is when God closes one door, he'll open two. Have you found that? So you can see by what I've shown you this morning that you can rewire your brain right up until the day we die. And when we start rewiring our brain, it will not be easy. And my prayer is that you will take up the challenge to rewire your brain. Rewire your brain so that you can have a healthier, happier life. Well, I found that that teaching very, very powerful. And I saw where it connected with what we've been studying about the fragmented soul and, and healing our fragments, healing our parts, because we do want to love Yahuwah with our whole heart. And it also goes hand in hand with what we understand with the horse and rider, correct? The horse being the emotions, the rider being the thinking, and we have to maintain the balance or what Barbara was sharing. We have to maintain that balance between our emotional brain and, and our I will brain, our intellect, reason, and judgment. And then we have to set our goals to be, I want to be all that Yahweh wants me to be. I want to follow his pathway, not my pathway that I've been ruminating in my mind over and over again. No, I want to follow that narrow path. Some very, very powerful and reinforcement of what we've been learning, especially with the law of forgiveness. <laughs> Again, in this little video teaching, it validated what Pastor Bob had talked about when you don't forgive, how it can spill over into the physical realm. Remember the man that wouldn't forgive his wife for adultery, he went blind? And this 40 year old man example that Barbara gave, he had prostate cancer because of unforgiveness. He had put a rut in his thinking of anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, and it spilled over into his physical body. I love the part where Barbara talked about the I want, W-A-N-T, I want part of the brain where is the law of choice? He's given us choice. She called it the prefrontal cortex, or we normally call it just the frontal lobe. And what did she call the I want part? She called it the guardian, the guardian. So could we have like this internal guardian angelic messenger called the frontal lobe that Yahuwah helps communicate to so we can get on that narrow path? She also talked about how the law of cause and effect and how the we have one trillion nerve cells and we can cause a groove in that by the way we we think and 
what we focus on, if we focus on that anger toward a relative and so forth and so on, if we don't forgive, but if we do forgive, she talked about the glial cells, G-L-I-A-L cells. And she said, they are more, there are more of the glia cells than there are nerve cells. And when we forgive, those cells can clean up. In essence, can't they kind of minister to our bodies as we sleep? cleaning up, healing us through the power of how Yahuwah made us. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And she spoke how the nerve cells don't touch each other. They communicate via chemical what? Chemical messengers, messengers that travel two to 200 miles per hour. So by the power of forgiveness, we can develop that new pathway, a pathway to healing. So very, very powerful. I, I hope you took notes. I plan on re-listening to that again and taking even more notes. And hopefully there's even a transcription and if, um, if I do a transcription or get that, uh, I think it's something that we can review and, and learn from. And the fact of developing new brain cells. Hallelujah. Neurogenesis. And what promotes that? She said the three shockers, fasting or finishing a hot shower with a quick cold shower. And she said quick to stimulate the brain cells or high intensity interval training. And she also mentioned three things we can grow. We can grow new pathways. We absolutely can. See, Yahuwah wants to heal us. He wants to integrate us. He wants us to be able to love him with our whole heart, our whole soul, our mind, will, and emotions. And we can grow new dandrites and we can grow new brain cells. So with Yah, he can, he can rebuild us. So I just felt like that video that Carol Ann came across really spoke to me in a powerful way about the angelic messengers. We know Jacob's ladder. We know that was that was more of a ladder that reached to heaven and, and he saw angelic messengers traveling up and down. And in our day and age, we can see that through what science had has discovered about how our ladder of DNA, it has messengers that travel up and down it and repair it. That was a discovery I feel for today because Yahweh wants us to know how fearfully and wonderfully made we are. He is the great physician. He is the great physician. Do we trust him? So I think it's very important for us to see all these lessons that Yahuwah reveals to us in a micro way and in a macro way. We know that the Feast of Weeks leading to Pentecost, as we discussed last week, is a microcosm of the Jubilee cycle of 50 years, setting the captives free, setting the captive away from death. Hallelujah. And the epic Jubilee is yet to come when he returns. So throughout his word, he gives us micro view examples that explain macro views of a bigger picture. The Feast of Weeks leading to Pentecost was a training tool in a micro view of us understanding the 50 years leading to Jubilee. 
In the message of the manna I gave, some of you may have watched it, some of you may have attended Sukkot 2022. Some may have watched the, the video teachings. We saw how the scattered particles of manna had been gathered, they'd have to gather them, they'd have to shape and mold them by heat to form cakes. They'd have to press them together, scattered, and they'd have to be gathered and made into one. And in the Fragmented Soul series, we are seeing how our individual soul can break into pieces for short-term protection, but needs to be refined and restored with the help of Yahusha. This takes place individually in the microcosm, if you will, and in the macrocosm, if you will, of the one new man, the corporate body of believers, the bigger picture of all of us coming together. Yahuwah has allowed the remnant of the one new man to fragment and remain scattered over the seven continents for a season for protection for protection. He's allowed that for protection of his bride and somewhat to hide, hide the bride. But when the timing is right, Yahweh will integrate the parts. He will integrate the parts. When the timing is right, he will integrate the parts individually and as our corporate body with Yahusha as the head. Until this happens, we must trust that he knows what he is doing as we walk by faith and not by sight. Today's devotional covered several key points, and I, I have the devotionals listed on my website, thelivinglink.com, all in one-stop shopping, if you will. For those that have really busy lives, and I can't imagine anyone these days that don't have really busy lives, to have all the scriptures right there. There's your daily devotional. Read of it what you can. Read of it what Yahweh wants to feed you that day. He, he, he may just want you to have one verse out of that daily devotional. <laughs> he made the manna appeal to everyone in the wilderness. He, he made the manna meet that individuals person's need and that's what he does with his manna from heaven his his word so is it is it any coincidence or any coincidence that in today's devotional Deuteronomy 15 covers the jubilee release no in Isaiah 42 is it any coincidence that he reviews a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out? Is it any coincidence that I cross-reference Micah chapter 4 verse 1? The chapter telling us where Mount Zion will be placed and gathered? Do you know where Mount Zion is going to be? His word tells us in Micah 4 Chapter four, verse one, and in the latter days, it shall be that the mountain of the house of Yahuwah, the mountain of the house of Yahuwah is established where? It's established on the top of the mountains, on the top <laughs> of the mountains of the on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above, above the hills and peoples shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of Yahuwah, to the house of the Elohim of Jacob and let him teach us his ways and let us walk, what? Let us walk, what? In his paths. That's Micah 4, 1 and 2. His word leads us to his narrow path. For out of Zion comes forth the Torah and the word of Yahuwah from Jerusalem. Isaiah 42, 16 was also in today's devotional. 
And I shall lead the blind by a way that, excuse me, and I shall lead the blind by a way they have not known. In paths they have not known, I lead them. I make darkness light before them and crooked places straight. These matters I shall do for them and I shall not forsake them. And then also in today's devotional, what do we have? Revelation 12, the birthing of the one new man with Yahusha as the head. In the birth process, we know the head is delivered first and then we, the body. We are the final remnant. Now, at the very end, I want to go over some really cool things about the counting calendar, the 360-day counting calendar. And for those that went through the Daniel series with me, we went through some timelines. And, and as many of you know, I, I am still counting from the time Yahweh told me to start counting. I'm not a calendar expert, but I do listen to Yah. And when he tells me to do something, I do it. And wherever that leads, it leads. I'm not saying I have all of this figured out, but I am a watchman on the wall. And like all of you, I'm watching and waiting for his soon return. Because time is short. And because of that, we need to redeem the time, do we not? In him, we are all leaders. We are all leaders. Keep in mind, a leader is someone that influences others spurs them on to become all that Yahuwah wants them to be. As his kingdom of priests, after the order of Melchizedek, we should all be good leaders, setting the example, being set apart. He said, be holy for I am holy. Now the world, on the other hand, says that you tell a good leader, but look at how many people are following them. That's that's the what the world calls a good leader, is look behind you and see how many people are following you. Yahweh has never been about big numbers, has he not? Or have I missed something? I don't think I've missed that point. Because that is not what the Bible equates to being a godly leader. A godly leader is following Yahuwah's word, setting a set apart example. We know the scripture that talks about broad is the path that leads to destruction and narrow is the path that leads to life. And there are few that find it. There's not a whole bunch of people following the narrow path. So, just because you might say, well, you know what, how can y'all use me? How can y'all use me? Oh, he, he can use you. And it's not about numbers. It's about influencing, influencing others with the word of Yahuwah, not our own words, not anything from us, but his word. Now, as we go into chapter 13 of the Fragmented Soul, as you recall, we did, many of us participated in the Q&A of session 12, and I chose not to replay that for all of you. If you want to listen to it again, please just go to chapter 12 and listen to the Q&A session. But it was very informative, was it not? It talked about how to break soul ties. It reminded us about what part of us gets saved. Of course, it is our spirit that gets born anew. 
our soul still has a lot of work to be done, but we should over time continuously be bearing improvement and good fruit. And if that's not happening, you may have to question exactly what, what, what happened when that person made their profession? Were they just repeating words that someone told them to repeat or was it a change of the heart? So it was emphasized in that Q and A, what part of us gets saved? It, it's our spirit that gets saved. It does go into how to break soul ties and also what to do when you, you suspect you are speaking to a fragmented part, such as a little part. You know, now that we kind of understand what's happening to people, now that we understand that there can be like a single broken heart to multiple fragments, now we're able to, and in part two, he reviews the, the different parts and we start understanding what to look for and listen to, to identify a switch in a person that we, we walk on this earth with every day. But it can be subtle. It, it can be a child that's a grown adult calling a parent mommy. Um, it can be a grown adult coming to you and crying about a splinter in the thumb or a cracked fingernail. You know, you'll see a mismatch, will you not? And that will help us understand how we may respond to that person. Now, I'm not saying we're coaches yet, but we should apply at least some of what we've learned. And we should at least know that, wait, whoa, something's off here. And maybe I should respond to about that age group that that person is coming across to me, uh, maybe a hurt part in that individual. So that's brought out in the Q and A. And at some point, I don't know if it was in part 12 or part or this part, Pastor Bob spoke of some people get stuck in ventilation. That's the second V if you will. So you have violation, you have ventilation. And I thought that was very intriguing because I don't know if y'all have, but I, I have talked to people before and, you know, I may, may be talking to them several times in one week and then it may be a month and I talk to them maybe later on and it's the same story. It's the same ventilation. It's this, they're not moving on. So what, when Pastor Bob does join us again, my question is this, and I want y'all to ponder this too. When someone is stuck in ventilation and they keep on repeating the same ventilation, 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 they don't move on. How does that differ from a pity party or when do we realize that even though we may have asked the key question to even break looping, why, why is it that person stays in ventilation? So these are the things that, you know, that's just something y'all led me to. And as you go through these sessions, be thinking about things like that. So when Pastor Bob does is able to join us, we can ask him. Okay, so now we'll listen to part 12 of the Fragmented Soul grouping. And don't forget, at Sukkot, when, when Yahuwah led the people out of Egypt, the first campsite was Sukkot, and he put, grouped the Israelites into their tribes. <laughs> 